This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Finding Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I am Parker Wagnold, an eighth grader at Mid Pacific Institute. I am both excited and honored today to have the Chief Justice of Hawaii Supreme Court, Mark Rechtenwald, here with me today. C.J. Rechtenwald was appointed by Governor Linda Lingle in 2010 to lead the judiciary as Hawaii's fifth Chief Justice. He kindly agreed to allow me to interview him for this show, and I appreciate him making the time in his busy schedule to talk with me today. Chief Justice Rechtenwald, thanks for being here. Hey Parker, thank you so much for having me and thank you to Think Tech Hawaii for giving me this opportunity as well. Yeah. Thanks, and rather than spend time with a long introduction, I hope it's okay with you if I jump right into some questions and let you tell us about yourself and your role as the Chief Justice Absolutely. of Hawaii Supreme Court. All right, so let's start with a bit of mm -hmm. a civic essence. You are the head of the judicial branch of government. What does that mean? Well, under our Constitution, there are three branches of government, the uh, legislature, the executive, and the ju judiciary. So the legislature, in a nutshell, writes the laws. The executive branch is tasked with implementing the laws. And we're tasked with the judiciary interprets and upholds the law, and including uh, protecting the rights of individuals under the Constitution. Yeah. That's very interesting, which um, kind of leads us into our, um, my, well, my second question. Um, the state Supreme Court is not a trial court, it's appeals court. Can you explain how that works? So in our, in our judicial system, uh, we have trial courts, and their, their primary function is to determine the facts in a case. So if there's a jury trial, which typically happens in our, it was, happens in our circuit court, uh, the jurors will be instructed in the law, and then they'll uh, decide how the law applies to the facts and come up with a verdict one way or the other, whether it's a criminal case or civil case. And similarly, uh, sometimes there's a bench trial. That means the judge performs that function as well. So once the trial is over, uh, if the parties feel that there was something about that process that was unfair or incorrect, they have the opportunity to appeal. And they can go first to our state's Intermediate Court of Appeals, which looks at the record in the case and tries to decide whether it thinks there was an error or not and makes makes a decision and then ultimately uh, people can then ask my court to review it as well and just what we're trying to do is decide whether the process that was followed was fair uh, whether it was uh, consistent with our law and rules and whether there should be another trial or actually a different outcome in a uh, nutshell that's that's the role of an appellate court as opposed to a trial court nice so you mentioned appeals does it make you frustrated when like people appeal uh, about something you feel strongly about? No, you know, our job, our, our job as uh, judges is to put aside our personal beliefs and follow, and follow the law. And so, you know, we're always focused on uh, what is the law, how does, what is the law, uh, what is the law in this case, how does it apply to the facts of this case? And we, we try to put aside, you know, our personal beliefs and, and just focus on what it is that the law requires. That's called the rule of law. We're, mm -hmm. we're here to decide uh, by the law, independent of our own views, independent of who it is that might be bringing an appeal and try to decide what the law requires. Oh, that's great. That's great. So how, what do you feel the Supreme Court is doing well? I have heard from um, your courts in the community program from my father. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I think one thing that we've really emphasized at the court since I've become Chief Justice is uh, being transparent and accessible to the community and probably the best example of that is that we've got, uh, taken the court now out into the community and we're holding oral arguments uh, at high schools around the state. And in real cases, not just you know mock cases, but the actual cases, uh, we'll go out uh, to, vary, to a particular high school and in advance of us going there, members of the bar, so attorneys, uh, volunteer to go out to the uh, classrooms of the students who are going to be attending the argument to work with the teachers to actually explain to the students what the case is about, uh, what the role of the lawyers is going to be, and what my court is going to be, and some and uh, if they have time, actually give the students the opportunity uh, to uh, engage in a, a practice oral argument of that actual case. So, when we get to the uh, the the, the uh, high school and we convene the program, the students who are attending they know what the case is about, they understand the issues. It's a great educational experience for them. Uh, to see uh, the law in action and to see our court in action. We've been able to do this now. We did the first one in 2012. We've gone out now eight times um, since then. 
uh, we think, I think we've had more than 3,000 students uh, have participated. So when we go to a particular island, for example, uh, on Maui, we'll invite students from across the island to come. Uh, same thing, East Hawaii, West Hawaii, and then particular areas of this island. So uh, it's been a great opportunity for us uh, to engage the community and to let our young people see the rule of law in action. And we're going to be uh, back on the uh, east side of Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Island uh, in November, and then in Castle High School uh, in December this year. So we're really excited about that program. Yeah. That's also a good, like, as you said, a good educational thing because absolutely, I would enjoy that because that may be a good learning opportunity for me. Yeah, so. and I hope uh, I hope that you'll have that opportunity yeah. as a as a student uh, at, at Midpac. Yeah, how does it um, differ from doing it in a court opposed to doing it like in a gym or a gymnasium? Like, yeah, well, we try to. Uh, you know, one thing that's, as I said before, this, these are actual cases. So, you know, the parties, uh, it's very important for them. Obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot riding on it for the parties who brought the case to the court. So uh, we try to do everything during that hour, our, our oral argument, which is the opportunity for lawyers to present their view of what happened in the trial court to us, argue whether we should affirm what happened or, or, or go a different direction. Um, we're very aware that this is a really important to them, and so for that one hour, we do everything exactly as if we were in our courtroom here in Honolulu. So, the case is called, the court, the room is absolutely quiet, uh, and and we conduct the proceedings just like we would in our courtroom. And that's something that, you know, I've, we've all all the members of the court have been really impressed with the students who have watched. You know, sometimes we have more than 500 students in attendance, and they're invariably really well behaved, respectful of the process, they understand how important it is. So we've been able to uh, give an experience to the lawyers and the parties that's really the same experience they'd have in our own courtroom except there are so many more folks watching. Yeah, that's awesome. So now you are the Chief Justice. How many other justices are there? What does it mean to be a Chief Justice? Do you have the power to overrule other justices? Well, we have we have a total of five justices on the court. So myself, and then and then four others. So, uh, as a member of the court, uh, I, I I don't have the power to overrule anyone. I'm one of five, you know, and, and each of my colleagues and I uh, have the ability to to vote on a particular case and what the outcome of a particular case should be. So in that regard, I'm, I'm you know, my my role or my responsibilities are very similar to that of my colleagues. But as chief justice. Uh, I have a responsibility for providing leadership in the court in terms of administrative issues, and then I'm also administratively responsible for the entire judiciary. So that is an organization of uh, 1,900 employees. We're on every uh, island across the state or in every county across the state. Uh, we have a budget of more than $160 million. So I, in addition to my role as a justice, I also have the role of providing leadership uh, to all of the judges and staff and all of our programs statewide. So that is a very different responsibility. Uh, so you kind of all make um, decisions as a collaborative effort? That's correct. So when a case comes up, uh, typically one of the justices will look at that case first, evaluate what happened in the trial court and in our inter intermediate court of appeals, make a preliminary recommendation to the court. Um, most of the time we'll have oral argument, which I described to you before, where the lawyers have the opportunity to come in and, and present their case verbally for about an hour explaining their position. Uh, sometimes we don't feel oral argument is necessary, and so just based on the papers that are presented to us, we'll make a decision. But typically, one justice takes the lead in reviewing the case, making a recommendation, and then we will confer. And if, um, if that justice ends up being in the majority, typically that will be the person who will write the opinion of the court. And um, if there are justices who disagree or have slightly different views, although they've reached the same outcome, they have the opportunity to write separate opinions. So if they disagree, that would be a dissenting opinion. If they agree but want to add a little something uh, to what the majority has written, that's called a concurring opinion. So does it kind of make you frustrated, like when you feel strongly on one and then the other judges, I mean, the other, like, disagree with you? Not at all. I think, you know, for us, and I, and, and I know my colleagues on the court would agree with this, uh, I feel that when you have multiple points of view, um, that helps to test um, the, the validity of each position. Uh, we often will go through uh, multiple drafts of an opinion. So typically, uh, whoever is writing the majority opinion uh, will present, will circulate a draft of that opinion, and if someone is dissenting, 
they'll write then a, dis a draft dissent, and those will go back and forth, and they'll change materially, and there'll be multiple drafts. And I think uh, that process, um, again, you're sort of testing each other's positions, sort of identifying flaws, hopefully being able to respond to them and make the opinion stronger. So I think it leads to uh, a, a, a much better product in the end, that we're able to put out something that is thoroughly thought out, all different points of view have really been um, examined, uh, and the and the resulting uh, opinion is a really strong is stronger for having gone through yeah. that process. So I have another um, good question for you. So, how do you choose like which cases to hear and decide? So typically, um, when you know, and there are some there are some uh, other situations, but the the typical situation for us is when the Intermediate Court of Appeals makes a decision in a case, the parties have the opportunity uh, to petition to my court to ask my court to review that decision. So we're typically going to look to see if we believe there's been a significant error on the law that's been made by the Intermediate Court of Appeals, uh, if there's a conflict between what that court did and some of our own decisions or some other decisions of that court. Uh, and ultimately then the question will be whether a majority of my colleagues thinks that we should accept that case for further review. So it's a discretionary decision. There are some other processes where cases can come, uh, bypass the Intermediate Court of Appeals and come directly to us uh, if the parties request it. But the majority of our cases come to us uh, after the Intermediate Court of Appeals has decided the case and then the parties, one of the parties wants further review. Typically one of the parties oh, wants further review. That's interesting. So. Um so can you tell us a little bit uh, about some of the cases you work with? Well, you know, we decide w literally every kind of case that comes up through our state court system comes to, comes to the Hawaii Supreme Court. So we have uh, criminal appeals in criminal cases where, where, where someone's been charged with violating a criminal law. We have civil cases, so that can be anything ranging from uh, a breach of contract to uh, an eviction to a car crash. Uh, we have a lot of cases that come from our family courts, and that can be a divorce case. It can be uh, a, a case in which um, a, a, somebody who's in the juvenile justice system uh, has been adjudicated in that system, and there's an issue that's arisen in that, in that context. Uh, there are cases involving uh, situations where there are allegations of abuse or neglect involving a child, and, and there's a question of whether that child's parents should con continue to I have the right to raise that child. So those are very, very difficult cases. Yeah. So literally anything that is in our state court system ultimately can come up to our court. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because some of those can be pretty difficult and it's sometimes like it's a hard decision and <laughs> not well, something that I would Yeah, they're tough. Be they can at. be very tough cases and, you know, you just have to I think the thing that makes it the, the, that gives us comfort is, you know, we, 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 we look to what the law requires. We look to what, you know, the Constitution or statute or whatever our own decisions have been uh, suggests should be the outcome in the case. And I think that, uh, you know, that gives us um, some, some comfort in knowing that what we're doing is trying to apply, identify, uh, interpret, and ultimately uphold the law. So, and also you kind of don't want to take it, like, too personally. I think I think that's right. You know, I mean, obviously, we're, we're you know we're 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 aware of uh, the things that are happening and how important these cases are to the people involved. We want to be sure that we reach a result that's just, you know, and 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 fair in a particular instance. But we also uh, have to do that within the context of the law. Yeah. Well, we're gonna take a commercial break now. All right. So. This, I've been talking with Chief Justice Rectiwa, and when we come back, we're going to learn more about his life when he was younger. I'm Parker Widenode, and you're watching Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have, she said. All the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the starting line. Hush. When this is over, you're dead. 
Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Plenty, right. I think we're going to have more than We that. are back, and I am talking with the Chief Justice Rechtenwald, and you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Community Matters. So now we're going to learn more about his life when he was my age. <laughs> so I want to switch tax here and learn more about Martin Rechtenwald when he was younger, like my age. What was your like favorite subjects in school, and which subjects did you prefer and or dislike? You know, I've always liked writing, so I think I guess I'd have to say uh, English was something I, I was always passionate about because I, I've, even then and, and through to the time uh, now, uh, writing has been something I've always really enjoyed doing. Um, you know, I remember being uh, okay at math, but not it, not having it be as much of a passion for me as uh, as just you know using words and being able to. Uh, communicate effectively to folks. Yeah, I just I just try to make my teachers like me so that that's I don't get yelled a at. Very good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so, on to the next one. Were Were you like a good student? What were your favorite subjects and what kind of sports um, did you play? Yeah, you know, I I, I think I was particularly when uh, up through middle school and into high school. I, I worked really hard on my studies and and um, you know my parents were very very supportive of me. I, I was an only child. So, you know, I think they did um, kind of keep an eye on me and make sure that I was doing my work. And, you know, um, so it, it became something that was just part of, of who I was to, to try to do the best I could in school and, and try to do a good job on my homework. So, like I said, I think English was something that um, I liked a lot. Um, that was something my mother was a high school English teacher. So, um, you know, she was always there to support me in that. Um, I was also a, a, a swimmer, so I was a competitive swimmer pretty much from when I was eight years old through the time I was in high school. So that really was something that took up a lot of the time when I wasn't in school, I was in the pool basically. Yeah, that's also the same for me because when yeah. I have like outside sports, it's hard to have time in the middle where you can like do your work. So sometimes I will stay up like really late to get them done so that like I don't have any bad grades. Yeah, I mean, I remember coming back from, you know, practice at dinner time, getting dinner, and then having to go study until bedtime. And, you know, that's just, that's kind of what goes along with the territory of, of, of trying to be an athlete and a, and a student as well. Yeah. So what um, swim events did you do? Well, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I ended up doing a, doing a little bit of all of them. So I kind of, I started out as a backstroker and ended up being like a, a freestyler and breaststroker just because... Um, you know, as time went by, I'd done it for so long. I guess I, I, I sort of tried different different things along the way and tried to get better at, better at different strokes. So it's something, um, uh, but I, I don't think I ever got really good at any one of them. But I got like okay at, at a lot. <laughs> right. of <them>. Yeah, <laughs> same. <laughs> so were you more of a two hundred meter or a fifty meter? Yeah, you know, when I started, I think I I, I never was super fast in a short short race. So it's probably more like a two like kind of more of a 200 meter swimmer yeah. um, and uh, but you know again it's uh, it's a when you do distance events as you know you really have to you have to swim you have to put in a lot of yards and uh, um, so you know that's something that uh, I, I'm really grateful I did it you know because um, I think it gave me uh, a real sort of it's just made that part of my life so even now I still try to run and swim and you know the discipline again of having to just go and work out, even if you're tired and don't want to particularly want to do it, that's an important thing to learn because it's not always going to be easy when you take on other things in your life and sometimes you just have to be able to put your head down and do what needs to be done. Yeah. So um, I have some more questions about yeah. your um, childhood. So what were your hobbies or interests outside of school? You know, I remember I remember uh, liking hiking and camping. So, you know, um, growing up, I, know, I remember with my friends would go you know, on ride bikes, uh, go go camp at like a local uh, state park. Um, so it's you know really kind of, uh, and you know it's just kind of like hanging out in our neighborhood. You know, maybe playing ball, uh, hanging out in the street, and uh, um, so those are all things I look back on and you know feel really fondly about. Yeah. So um, for kids my age, yeah. would you recommend me if I was interested in law? Yeah. Would you recommend me to like be a chief justice? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, and I guess the first step, of course, is becoming a lawyer. So you have to be a lawyer to, to do what I do. And, you know, when I think about the law, you know, the, the thing that's really, there's a couple of things I think make it a great area to go into. One is, you know, it really does prepare you to think rigorously about, 
problems and analytically look at all sides of an issue and be, and be really thorough in doing that. Uh, it gives you the ability to do a lot of different things in your life, uh, whether it's you know being a litigator or helping people in a business, helping shape public policy. And, and the biggest thing it does is I think it really gives you the ability to give back to your community. So you know as a lawyer, um, you can you know as you can be a public citizen. So somebody who helps shape the dialogue in your community, helps shape the arguments about what's important and what needs to be done to make the community better. And so you can find a lot of ways to give back. In my case, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to become a judge and ultimately to become Chief Justice. It's, you know, it, it's an incredible opportunity uh, to dry, try to do things that are positive for our community. So, um, you know, I'm very grateful that I pursue the course of going into the law and I'd recommend it without reservation for young people. Yeah. So in um, high school, what, um, how is it different from middle school when you were like in high school? Like what high school did you go to? Well, I started out um, in high school uh, in, my, in my hometown. So the first two years I went to high school uh, at Lake Forest High School in the suburbs of Chicago. And so pretty much doing you know, what I'd been doing all, all, all along that, that part of my life. And then in my junior year, I took a very different turn and uh, decided uh, to go to a, a boarding school. So it was in a different state away from home in Massachusetts. And that was a really good experience for me because I got to meet folks from different parts of the country, people uh, who had really different uh, perspectives and teachers who kind of came at things a little differently from the way I'd, uh, maybe I'd seen them in my, in my old school. So for me, that was a great experience. It kind of uh, served as a bridge to going to college and caused me to you know, just start thinking about the world and uh, seeing a bigger world and beginning to think about how I might fit into it. Uh, yeah, that's great, and like it's also good to meet new people, so you can expand your friendship and learn new things. Absolutely. Yeah. So, moving on to more school mm -hmm. stuff, um, were you popular in school? What kind of friends did you hang around? You know, I think I was pretty. You know, I was like I said, I worked pretty hard, and I was really kind of you know did swimming outside. So you know, I I, I think I was probably thought of as being you know kind of a studious kid. Um, uh, but it was interesting because I also had friends who were athletes, you know, and so I had a little bit, you know, I kind of knew folks from both both of those worlds. Um, and, you know, I, I look back on it and, you know, I, I, I feel like I had, um, you know, I, I think I had a good experience. You know, it's never, e it's never easy being a kid sometimes and there's always challenges, but I felt like uh, the, the one thing I really look back on and I'm very grateful for is my, my parents were just amazing yeah. to me and they gave everything they had to try to support me and give me opportunities in my life. And so that's something I'm very, very grateful for. That's awesome. It seems like over time decisions get made in the courts and someday they, there should not be many left to decide. Is that like a dying profession? I, I don't think so at all. And, you know, oh, yeah. a couple reasons. You know, one is conditions change and things change. And so, you know, um, as technology advances, as police practices advance, as what's going on in our community changes, the, the, the guarantees of the Constitution have to be uh, applied to those new situations. Statutes that were, or laws that were written, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago have to be applied to what arises. So there's always something new, always something different to consider. I think the one big thing, though, that I think we do as a profession have to focus on is being sure that we're accessible to people and that the, the process of being able to get into court in a civil court is something that people can afford that's um, reasonable and a they're able to understand it. They can hopefully get a lawyer, but if they're not able to get a lawyer, that the system will be friendly enough to them and uh, understandable enough that they can be able to navigate it themselves. And that's been one of the major things we've done at the judiciary in the last six years is we have something called an access to justice commission and it focuses completely on trying to find ways to help folks um, be able to navigate the legal system in, in the civil case in a civil case and whether that's getting more uh, funding for legal aid uh, who represents folks who can't afford a lawyer or trying to help people uh, through what we call self-help centers where lawyers go and volunteer their time in our courthouses those are the things that we're trying to do to make the system more accessible so we remain relevant and, and open to our community. Yeah. So when you were a kid, did you have anything you wanted to do differently? Like 
Any regrets? No, you know, I, I like I said, I, I, I was blessed to have parents who were just so wonderful to me, and I look back on it, you know, and, and, and it's not a regret. You know, if there's one thing I could do now, I wish I could go back and tell my parents how much I appreciate what they did for me and how much I love them and thank them for that. But um, so if I share anything with, with folks of your generation, I'd say, you know what, um, just uh, look around and realize that, you know, you have people in your life who love you and care for you. Uh, just, you know, sometimes tell them thank you and tell them you appreciate what they're doing for you because um, that's what makes all the difference in the world. And it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be a coach, but those are the people who really make a difference in your life. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, a lot of people in my generation, like, they don't really do that. And I, I am kind of guilty of that. I don't thank my parents that much, like, yeah, it's a as good much thing. as and, I know, should. Neither did, you know, I look back on it and I think, gosh, I didn't, you know, I look at all the things they did for me and I wish, I, you know, back then I, I you know, you think like, oh, that's just the way it is. Well, you know, you got to realize people make sacrifices. And so that would be the one thing I, I wish I could go back now and tell them how much, uh, you know, how much I appreciate what they did for me. I know I did it then, but I wish I could do it even more and have another chance to do it now, Parker. So I'm going to move on to another subject. Absolutely. Too. Uh, when have you started be like getting into like more law stuff? Like, was it like a lifetime thing or? No, you know, well, it was something I always was aware of because my father was a lawyer too. But you know, I looked at doing different things. That I think what really changed it for me is I, I had the opportunity after I was in college to go work in Washington D.C. on Capitol Hill, and the people who I saw there who really were able to make an impact. They were journalists and they were lawyers. And I looked up to those folks and I thought, you know, that's something I would really like to do. Both of them, I, I was a journalist for a while. I worked as a reporter. Uh, and then I decided that law was really the calling for me. So, you know, I'd done a lot of different things, thought about it and, 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 and came to the conclusion that was the right way for me to be able to contribute the way I wanted to contribute. Well, guys, with all good things must come to an end. I just wish you had a little bit more time. I want to thank Chief Justice Rechtenwald for coming and talking with me today. Um, thank you, thank Parker. You. It was just great to have this opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank you for giving me this opportunity again. Thanks to Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks. Yeah. I'm Parker Widenow, and this has been another episode of Finding Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii.